And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Egypt remains in a state of political crisis one week after the military ousted President Mohamed Morsi after days of massive protests. On Tuesday, Egypt's interim president, named former finance minister Hazem El Beblawi, as interim prime minister, and also named Nobel Peace Laureate Mohamed Al Baradei as vice president. The appointments came one day after Egypt's interim leaders announced a timetable for forming a new elected government and ratifying a new constitution. But several key groups have voiced concern over the military's plans, including Egypt's Coptic Church, Salafis, and the youth-led Tamarod movement. Tamarod said the military's plan, quote, lays the foundation for a new dictatorship. Members of Mohamed Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood continue to oppose all moves by the military to form a new government. This is Safwat Hegazi, a prominent cleric and Muslim Brotherhood supporter. Egypt's legitimate president is Mohamed Morsi, and he alone has the right to appoint a prime minister or agree on other ministers to be appointed. And with regards to the military and the person they are calling the interim president, they are all thieves, and it is not their right to appoint ministers or prime ministers, and we reject these appointments altogether. Meanwhile, Egypt's prosecutor's office has ordered the arrest of the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood movement, Mohammed Badi. He's accused of inciting violence in Cairo in the days after the coup. The arrest warrant is seen as part of a broader crackdown on members of the Brotherhood. Hundreds of members of the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups have been detained, along with the former president's top advisers. On Monday, the Egyptian armed forces shot dead more than 50 supporters of Mohammed Morsi during a protest outside Cairo's Republican Guard barracks, where the deposed leader is believed to be held. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have offered $8 billion in aid to the interim government to help shore up the economy and counter Qatar's support of the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, for more, we go to Cairo, where we're joined by Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif Abdelkadus. Welcome back, Sharif. We last talked to you on Monday. You just come from the site of the massacre. Now the uh, Egypt's top prosecutor has ordered the arrest of the Muslim Brotherhood leader, Mohammed Ba. Can you talk about the significance of all of this? Right. This news just came down uh, a few minutes ago that Mohammed Badia, the supreme guide of the Muslim Brotherhood, has been ordered arrested along with several top aides. Uh, they're reportedly going to be charged with incitement to violence outside the Republican Guard headquarters. As you mentioned, uh, more than 50 uh, supporters of uh, Mohammed Morsi, the ousted president, were, were killed in uh, early Monday morning, mostly by live ammunition. Uh, and this was one of the bloodiest days since Mubarak's overthrow, if not the bloodiest uh, incident of state violence. Uh, this is a very troubling trend of an increase crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. They are still the largest political group in Egypt. Uh, we've seen their uh, members detained. Now their leaders, uh, the, their um, figurehead, the Supreme Guide, is being uh, ordered arrested. We've seen their uh, media channels being shut down. Uh, and the state media and private media have taken uh, completely adopted the military's line, uh, repeated the military's claims that the military came under attack first by armed assailants, hardly shown any video or uh, footage of the uh, attack and of the many dozens dead or wounded, and have, uh, have called the Muslim Brotherhood terrorists and so forth. And this has uh, only increased the polarization and division in the country. And and uh, it's, it'll be very difficult going forward when we have this kind of crackdown by the army and state security services, which are, have ridden this popular wave of anger against Mohamed Morsi for his many failures in his year of office and looking to reassert themselves into the state uh, and uh, into positions of authority. It's going to be very difficult going forward to have the biggest political group in the country not taking part and feeling like it is being oppressed, as it has been for many decades, uh, under successive autocrats. Uh, and uh, we'll have to see what happens in the, in the coming days. Sharif, what do you think accounts for the disproportionate crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood? What has been historically the relationship between the security forces and the Muslim Brotherhood? 
Well, as I mentioned, the Muslim Brotherhood has uh, suffered, long suffered oppression under successive autocratic regimes in Egypt. It was Gamal Abdel Nasser uh, in 1954, after he uh, led a coup against the pro-British monarchy, who first clamped down on the Brotherhood and drove them underground, uh, where they remained for very years. And uh, they, many of their leaders have been jailed, many of them have been uh, killed. Uh, but uh, since the, the revolution, they, I think, sought to co-opt parts of the state uh, when, uh, after coming into power through the ballot box. And so they uh, struck political pacts with uh, the uh, army, uh, granting it everything it wanted in the Constitution. Uh, it, uh, Mohamed Morsi repeatedly thanked the police. Uh, for their work, even despite mass police killings and torture. And uh, instead of, uh, I think, addressing grievances of people, he was seeking to co-opt these parts of the state, but ultimately failed. And uh, once this popular mobilization got going, in large part because of uh, the steadily declining economy, as well as political isolation and no real way for people to air their grievances, I think um, the army sought to step in, push the Brotherhood out, and reassert itself uh, into the states. Can you talk about the $8 billion promised by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, which to try to prevent the collapse of the Egyptian economy, but also seen as a counter to Qatar, which has been supporting the Muslim Brotherhood government, the vying between Arab rivals uh, for Egypt? Right. I mean, this is very significant. $8 billion coming at a time when uh, the Egyptian economy is on the brink of collapse. Uh, this will certainly support uh, the shaky military-led transition. And it comes in the wake, as you mentioned, of repeated cash injections from Qatar, who, which has uh, supported the Brotherhood through uh, this kind of aid, through uh, gas deals, and uh, helped prop up the Egyptian economy uh, in sort of an artificial way when it was really uh, uh, you know, collapsing from a lack of foreign reserves. So Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which uh, very much uh, want to see a return of, uh, you know, an army-led uh, and uh, or a return of the former regime, which they very much backed, and were very much afraid of. Uh, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and their, their claims to political Islam through the ballot box. I think they're very threatened by that and have historically been at odds uh, in, in certain, certain ways with Qatar over foreign policy, although Saudi Arabia and Qatar, of course, have the same similar policies towards Syria. So, I mean, this is a significant cash injection. $8 billion almost matches the total that Qatar has given over many months. So uh, it's a clear sign of support to uh, this military coup and to the army-led transition. Sharif, could you outline what some of the more controversial aspects of the Constitutional Declaration are and what the main opposition to the transition plan has been from all groups involved? Right. So this Constitutional Declaration essentially now is the law of the land after the head of the armed forces abolished the uh, 2012 Constitution that was pushed through by the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, it basically sets forth a very speedy uh, transition to uh, civilian government. It, uh, it's about 33 articles, and uh, it, it, it will essentially go in the order of amending the 2012 Constitution within four months by a committee of, uh, of, of legal scholars, followed by parliamentary elections and then presidential elections. Now, many critics say that this is repeating a lot of the same mistakes from the first army-led transition following Mubarak's ouster, uh, that it's, it was drawn up by an anonymous committee without any input from the main opposition groups that were calling for Morsi's ouster, including the National Salvation Front, including the youth-led group Tamarut, uh, who, have, uh, who have voiced criticism for not being consulted uh, in this process. It, uh, it's, you know, it's a bare-bones document that, that, that just outlines kind of the bare necessities, but given that, it makes very clear that it shields the military from civilian oversight. So it, that's a clear, uh, you know, it, it clearly prioritizes the military. And it promises uh, inclusiveness, but gives no procedural guidelines for how to do that. And the timetable is very fast. So it's not a, it, you know, it, it looks like it's repeating a lot of the same errors f of the first transition, which led to this political crisis. Uh, and we, we've seen the National Salvation Front and Tamar come out and be uh, quite critical, which is a step forward. At least they're voicing concerns that they're not being consulted. But we'll have to see going forward how much uh, their voice carries weight with the military at this point.
Uh, Sharif, the U.S. is not quite willing to call uh, what happened in Egypt a coup, which would jeopardize um, the uh, 1.3 or $5 billion the U.S. government gives to Egypt. Can you talk about the significance of that and what people are saying in Egypt, the many, uh, perhaps the largest protests, even larger than the anti-Mubarak ones that led to Morsi's downfall, um, like Tamara, the youth group, what they are now saying? Well, this is a very divisive question uh, in Egypt. This issue of do you call it a coup or do you call it uh, an uprising overthrowing Morsi? Uh, it's, and it's part of a growing polarization between uh, different camps in Egypt in a very complicated situation. Uh, I would say technically, of course, this was a coup. It was uh, the army that ousted Morsi. We saw the head of the armed forces uh, in Sisi get on TV. And, uh, you know, the, the interim president that we have right now in his constitutional declaration stated that his power comes from a CC's statement. So that's a clear sign that this was uh, a military coup, and we saw APCs and soldiers uh, deploying to the streets of Cairo. Having said that, uh, what forced uh, or what facilitated the military to come in was a mass popular uprising, like you mentioned, one that even eclipsed the, the level of protests we saw against Hosni Mubarak. And I think there was a culmination of different forces coming together, uh, ordinary Egyptians whose daily lives have become much harder uh, given the deterioration of the economy, political groups who felt completely isolated and rejected and not consulted on any um, uh, policy by Morsi or the Muslim Brotherhood. And we saw that the Brotherhood use its very thin electoral mandate uh, to push through uh, all of its policies without really consulting NGOs or civil society on any kind of state policy. And also, uh, as I mentioned before, looking to co-opt elements of the deep state, like the army and the police, and not looking to reform them whatsoever. So I think all of that culminated, and we have elements of the former regime as well, coming together on June 30th in this massive protest. And that allowed the military to reinsert itself into civilian politics in a very real way. And it's a very uh, difficult time right now, because I think the military is the most a possibly destructive force to Egyptian politics. It is the most brutal force. It has the biggest economic interests to defend. And uh, we're seeing them uh, very successfully at the moment reassert themselves, use this wave of popular anger against Morsi uh, to try and clamp down on any kind of dissent and that is being targeted really at Islamist groups right now. And we're seeing the state media, the private media, uh, really drumming uh, acting as a conveyor belt for the army's policies. And so it's a very difficult time right now in Egypt. Well, do, during the attack on Muslim Brotherhood supporters on Monday, an Egyptian photographer working for a newspaper affiliated with the party was killed. The 26-year-old journalist Ahmed Asim El Sanusi reportedly filmed his own death. His family released footage he took that reportedly shows an army sniper taking aim at him. This comes as several Al Jazeera reporters were arrested. In the past two weeks, two journalists and a student have been killed while documenting protests. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, prior to these deaths, only four journalists had been killed in Egypt since 1992. Uh, Sharif, could you uh, talk about the significance of this? What's been happening to the media in the midst of these protests and the ouster of Morsi? Well, we saw right when uh, the head of the armed forces ousted Morsi in that statement on July 3rd, the, the channel, the main channel of the Muslim Brotherhood, Mr. 25, went black. There was also raids and attacks by security forces on other pro-Morsi channels where workers were arrested, although many of them have been released, but those channels shut down. And so uh, we've hardly seen any coverage by the private media and, of course, the state media, which has completely towed the military line of these continued protests by the Muslim Brotherhood, hardly any coverage of, uh, of the massacre that happened on Monday at the hands of the military, completely adopting the military line. So is, there is this crackdown on the media. And uh, Al Jazeera, which has been seen, especially since the beginning of what we call the Arab Spring, uh, as being a pro-Morsi channel, has also come un under attack. Uh, Al Jazeera Mubashir Mis, which is a local affiliate, was raided. Uh, it's, uh, a lot of its... Uh, its director was, uh, was held for a day, and then subsequently a lot of its workers resigned, saying, uh, claiming bias from the, uh, their managers to, uh, you know, bias to 
influence the editorial line towards uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. But more than that, we've seen also, uh, as I said, private channels really demonize uh, Islamists, call them terrorists, and in a way incite violence uh, in their own way and uh, have no compassion whatsoever for the dozens of deaths uh, that took place on, on Monday. So uh, there's, there's a real polarization in the media, and, uh, you know, we hardly are, with the, the voices and the channels of the pro-Morsi camp really being silenced, we're only getting uh, ones that completely support the military. And it's a very vicious dialogue that's happening right now over the airwaves. And then, Shari, finally, the Al Jazeera um, Arabic reporter who was kicked out of the government news conference by other reporters who later applauded the spokesman. We're just going to play a clip. <laughs> That's the sound and scene at a news conference when they were throwing out the Al Jazeera Arabic reporter. Final comment, uh, Sharif. It's a shameful display of so-called journalists who completely supports uh, the military and uh, who uh, forced out this Al Jazeera crew out of the press conference by the army, uh, chanting out, out, out before the press conference started and refusing to allow it to begin before they were kicked out. So, uh, you know, these are a lot of uh, so-called journalists who completely toe the government line who report blithely what uh, the military says. And in fact, after the armed spokesman finished his press conference, loudly applauded uh, his, his uh, statements, which completely denied any wrongdoing of the killing of more than 50 people on the streets of Cairo. So uh, again, that's the kind of polarized media landscape we have, and frankly, very uh, terrible coverage from, uh, from almost any side. Of, uh, of what's happening uh, in Egypt. And we just have 30 seconds, Sharif, but the significance of the appointment of the prime minister, Bablawi, and the uh, vice president, um, who originally they were going to say was prime minister, the Nobel laureate, Mohamed al -Baradai. Well, Biblau is a liberal economist with an academic background. He's a founding member of the uh, Egyptian Social Democratic Party after Mubarak's ouster. He served as finance minister in 2011 under the first army-led transition. He's been somewhat critical of the military. He wrote a book criticizing uh, their heavy-handed approach over the first cabinets that he served in. He also submitted his resignation in October 2011 following the killing of 27 protesters at Nasfiro by the military, which is interesting given that he accepted this position a day after the military killed nearly double that uh, on the streets of Cairo. But I think it's important to remember, uh, ide ideologically, he won't be around for very long, and his position is really to be seen as a consensus candidate. And the important thing is how much political consensus he can build around him to form this new government. He's already reached out to the Muslim Brotherhood, which has firmly rejected any participation in uh, the new transition. I want to thank you for being with us again. Truth of Dokadus, Democracy Now! correspondent in Cairo, his most recent piece for The Nation. We'll link to it at democracynow.org. It's called What Led to Morsi's Fall and What Comes Next. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute.